Okay, so here I'm going to provide a brief overview of the endosymbiotic theory and how this kind of came about. Now, if you look here, this what is the endosymbiotic theory? Well, it's a hypothesized origin for eukaryotic cells. How do we get cells uh, that have kind of membrane-bound organelles? Well, looking here, we have a prokaryotic cell, uh, and there's a potential that cell membrane infoldings could have occurred. These infoldings can create little pockets, and these ultimately could have led to the development and specialization of different organelles. Now, two organelles in particular, if we're talking plant cells uh, for sure, uh, are very complex. They're the mitochondria and the chloroplast. If we're talking animal cells, we're just looking at the mitochondria. Now, mitochondria and chloroplasts are very complex, uh, very unique structures. So odds are that they probably just didn't come from in membrane foldings. The theory behind how they became incorporated into the cell, looking first at the mitochondria, where this aerobic oxygen using protobacterium enters the eukaryotic cell, could be either as a prey item or a parasite, and it manages to avoid digestion or being broken down. So that's an important component there. Exactly how it avoids that, not really sure if there's other theories regarding that, but it's taken into the cell and is not broken down. Then it becomes kind of an endosymbiote, and that's where we get the term endosymbiotic theory. Endo meaning inside the cell, symbiotic means both gaining a benefit here. So this uh, protobacterium that is generating its own energy using oxygen uh, is incorporated into the cell. So the cell has this advantage of this energy producing organelle. Protobacterium gains the advantage of being protected within this cell. So again, they're both receiving a benefit there. Now chloroplasts, if we're talking plant cells, also very complex. How did they kind of get incorporated into, into cells there? Well, as we'll see in a moment, chloroplasts have a lot of resemblance to cyanobacterium. So this is a potential uh, way that they could have been taken in, again, not digested, not broken down, and incorporated as part of the cell. Now, both the mitochondria and chloroplasts both contain their own, while small percentage, still their own DNA that isn't found in the nucleus. So this further supports the idea or the theory that they may have once been free living because they do have their own unique DNA. So if we're looking at that kind of comparison between our chloroplasts and our cyanobacterium, this just kind of shows you some of the similarities that do exist in their structures. You can see the outer membranes present in both, inner membrane present in both, nucleoids present in both. Again, that's kind of that DNA component there. Uh, thylakoids, uh, ribosomes in both. Now there are some you know, unique components to each because they are uh, different at this point, but the high degree of similarities indicates that they may have at one time been free living, and then some of them may have been incorporated into cells for the mutual benefit of, again, getting protection, the cell getting a way to generate energy, in this case, capturing the sunlight, the light energy, and converting it into chemical energy.